Good morning friends and it's Sunday the 18th of July and this morning we're considering a passage in Matthew chapter 15 verses 1 to 20. One of the punchy titles that I've come up with is hypocrisy, hypocrisy and more hypocrisy. And I need to tell you that all readings that are being used are of the message translation. Though the proper title, which we were given when we were asked to preach on the subject, uh, it covers, it's what comes out of our mouths that defiles us. Now, by way of introduction, uh, Matthew chapter 14 ends with Peter's incredible experience of attempting to walk on water which was successful until he lost his nerve and took his eyes off Jesus. Uh, The Bible tells us that after this event, the boat landed at Gennesaret, midway down the western side of the Sea of Galilee. And I've got a little map here. I hope you can see it. Uh, On the left, as you look at it, above Magdala and, and between there in Capernaum you see Gennesaret. So we ought to get on with our reading I guess. We're reading Matthew 15 1 to 20 and we hear this. After that Pharisees and religion scholars came to Jesus all the way from Jerusalem criticizing why do your disciples play fast and loose with the rules? Now, other Bible versions refer here specifically to the washing, hand washing. But Jesus put it right back on them. Why do you use your rules to play fast and loose with God's commands? God clearly says, respect your father and mother. And anyone denouncing father and mother should be killed. But you weasel around this by saying, whoever wants to, can say to father and mother, what I owed to you, I've given to God. That can hardly be called respecting a parent. You cancel God's commands by your rules. Frauds, Isaiah's prophecy of you, hit the bullseye. These people make a big show of saying the right thing, but their heart isn't in it. They act like they're worshipping me, but they don't mean it. They just use me as a cover for teaching whatever takes their fancy. That's the prophecy from Isaiah 29, verse 13. He then called the crowd together and said, Listen, and take this to heart. It's not what you swallow that pollutes your life but what you vomit up. Later, his disciples came and told him, Did you know how upset the Pharisees were when they heard what you said? Jesus shrugged it off. Every tree uh, that wasn't planted by my Father in heaven will be pulled up by its roots. Forget them. They are blind men leading blind men. And when a blind man leads a blind man, They both end up in a ditch. Peter said, I don't get it. Put it in plain language. Jesus replied, You too? Are you being willfully stupid? Don't you know that anything swallowed works its way through the intestines and is finally defecated? But what comes out of the mouth gets its start in the heart. It's from the heart that we vomit up evil arguments, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, lies and cussing. That's what pollutes. Eating or not eating certain foods, washing or not washing your hands, that's neither here nor there. Now the hand washing issue is apparently one of the later Jewish traditions it's not of the original Old Testament law 
And so we find Jesus' teaching here is deliberately confrontational with the rulings of the scribal law, which was known as the Halakha. There is also a hint that the Pharisees and scribes are an official deputation from Jerusalem to test whether Jesus conforms to the law. So I've added a little map here which uh, shows uh, the Sea of Galilee. Um, there's a blue arrow pointing into Gennesaret at the top on the left hand side of the little map. And down the bottom, there's a, thicker, there's a thick arrow pointing to Jerusalem. The distance between the two is approximately 75 miles, as the crow, or the raven flies in a way, I guess it is. So we know that there was concern in the capital about the Jesus gang not conforming with strict legal standards. Would it help us if we noted that a rabbi was also responsible for his disciples' lives, as well as their theology. Now, I want to step aside here to make a special comment relating to that last point. I found a piece recently that I thought was worth sharing. One of the extraordinary things about Jesus is how close he was to the Pharisees. There were other religious groups in Judaism at the time, but none seemed to pay so much attention to Jesus as did the Pharisees. Sometimes the Pharisees actually sought to protect Jesus. We read in Luke 13, 31. Just then some Pharisees came up and said, Run for your life. Herod's on the hunt. He's out to kill you. And at other times, we find that Jesus actually recommends that folks listen to the teachings of the Pharisees. Matthew 23, verses 2 and 3, included here. Now, Jesus turned to address his disciples, and along with the crowd that had gathered with them. He said, the religion scholars and Pharisees are competent teachers in God's law. You won't go wrong in following their teachings on Moses, but be careful about following them. They talk a good line, but they don't live it. But we find in the scriptures that his relationship with them is a lot more complex than the cowboys and Indians version that we may have heard sometimes. Jesus may refer to them as righteous and it will be without any irony or sarcasm. So we read in Mark 2, verses 15 to 17. Later, Jesus and his disciples were at home, having supper with a collection of disreputable guests. Unlikely as it seems, more than a few of them had become followers. A religion, a religion scholar and Pharisees saw him keeping his, this kind of company and demanded of his disciples, what kind of example is this? Acting cosy with the riffraff? Now Jesus overheard this and shot back, who needs a doctor, the healthy or the sick? I'm here inviting the sin sick, not the spiritually fit. Now, Jesus does have some disagreements with them, for the Pharisees seek righteousness and they teach obedience to the law. But Jesus seeks righteousness and teaches obedience to his commands. But both teach righteousness because they know that when God judges, he will reward the righteous with life and blessing, 
but punish the unrighteous with the sim and with the similarity of their religious beliefs it's small wonder that the pharisees hung around jesus there's a picture of the area close to where jesus would have been at this time it's shown in capernaum from the air however jesus took a different approach to teaching his approach to the holiness of the group was to get as many unholy people in as possible to teach them righteousness Here's a picture of the feeding of the 5,000 by Joachim Paternier. Now, we have to understand that he was not going soft because actually Jesus' teachings were even stricter than those of the Pharisees, for example, on divorce. But he even invited unholy people into his inner circle. This was not so that they could teach less than holy ways. Mark's Gospel tells us that Jesus never let his disciples actually teach. He tells them to proclaim judgment, to heal and exorcise, but not to teach. In Matthew, he only commissions them to teach once he has taught them. And we find this in Matthew 28. 18 to 20 God authorized and commanded me to commission you so go out and train everyone you meet far and near in this way of life marking them by baptism in the threefold name father son and holy spirit then instruct them in the practice of all that I have commanded you I'll be with you as you do this day after day after day right up to the end of the age no Jesus never went soft on holiness uh, instead he comes alongside people and teaches them not only how to live but also how they themselves can come alongside others and help those others to live so back to the main script obviously the pharisees thought that jesus was instructing his disciples to disobey the tradition of the elders this of course being the oral law which was continually elaborated and seemed to be going far beyond the old testament law upon which it was supposed to be based this eventually developed into the incredibly complicated regulations of the Mishnah which as I understand it is a book of collected sayings by the scribes and Pharisees and it is for repeated study so even though the washing ritual was a very recent rule in the Pharisees eyes Jesus should have known better we ought to note here that Jesus does not deny the charge brought against him and the disciples but he has a strong reply that undermines its significance yes they had transgressed the law but what was this law actually worth in this account of events in Matthew Jesus turns things back on the Pharisees There's a little fresco here depicting the Sermon on the Mount. He goes behind the outward act to that which proceeds from the heart. R.T. France, a theologian, suggests that the Jesus words indicate a view of original sin. That is, that sin springs from what we are in ourselves and not from our environment so we should not be surprised that the pharisees were offended by what jesus said for it cut at the very roots of their understanding of religion personally i think i would go further 
and say that Jesus shot that particular boat right out of the water. And far from apologising, Jesus declares that the Pharisees claim to be God's true people is false. Uh, it seems to echo the condemnation by John the Baptist that we see in Matthew 3 verses 10 and 12. Blind leading the blind is a very severe indictment of the Pharisees' failure to understand God's will. And it's, it's disastrous not only to themselves, but to those who follow and share the same approach to religion. Certainly, they were not the most conscientious shepherds of God's flock. If you happen to be thinking that there is a lot of complicated stuff here, and can I, can I really get anything useful out of it, maybe we should draw a few points out for reflection. First of all, bearing in mind the little fresco, let's consider the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 3 to 12, and also we find it in Luke 6, 20 to 23. We know that so much of Jesus' teaching ran contrary to normal thinking at the time, and indeed it would do for the present day. So in a sense, it was understandable that the Pharisees, having come all the way from Jerusalem, found themselves confounded by what Jesus said and how he reacted. Now, I liked this bit. The Pharisees seek righteousness and teach obedience to the law. Jesus also seeks righteousness, but teaches obedience to his commands, which, though sometimes stricter, are in no way as heartless and crippling as those the Pharisees have compiled over the years. And I have to say that his approach to the holiness of his group was to get as many pe unholy people in as possible so as to teach them righteousness. I was attracted to that. Let's remember that Jesus never went soft on holiness. Instead, he comes alongside people and teaches them not only how to live, but also how they themselves can come alongside others and help these others to truly live. Friends, in everything, Jesus demonstrated the heart of God, his heavenly Father, which is full of grace and truth. Reaching out to welcome folks to him for comfort, support, healing, and ultimately salvation in him through his death on the cross. I find that I am reminded of Jesus' words in John's Gospel, chapter 10 and verse 10. I came so that they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. Now, if on the off chance, other than being involved in our service this morning, you have come across this on, your, on YouTube, I recommend the offer from Jesus written above. Let him become your good shepherd. So I say thank you for taking the time to watch and listen. May God bless you real good. Amen.